The Philippines is 100 million people who eat 120 kilos of rice each per year, and they don't eat heirloom rices. They, they eat rices that are white, that are polished, that have the brand taken off, most of the nutrition removed, and they're all grown with chemicals. The only people growing and eating heirloom rices are the indigenous people in the north. The rices that they're harvesting are gorgeous, all different colors, different grain sizes. You can't fit them into one box. You can't use conventional milling methods because all the grains don't conform to the way rice has been standardized. There's thousands of varieties of rice grown in the world, but there's only about 10 or 15 that make it to our tables. And we're at risk of losing much of the DNA depth of the rice that's out there. This is it being dried. Margarita is one of the poster people for our product as we get ready to unlaunch it. There's going to be three different lines, each with producers' faces. We even put GPS coordinates on our product so people can find where the farmers are if they ever wanted to get that personal. We pay them for the use of their faces and stories. And this is the type of rice that margarita grows. Purple and brown and red are the three colors we're going to bring in. And do you know this year, with all the rice eaten in the Philippines and all the rice grown in the Philippines, there will be a total of one shipping container of rice that leaves the country. They will export one container this year, and it's going to come to my business. <laughs> really cool opportunity for us. But you know, when we get ready to sell it, the fact is that in the marketplace, the price is going to be higher. Because a mountain top was preserved. Indigenous people were paid dignified wages. The rice was grown without chemicals. It's slow-growing heirloom varieties. It was CO2 fumigated, which is an organic process of fumigation. There's costs for all of that but it's the most valuable rice you'll ever eat. Because if you preserve the mountaintop, then when the heavy rains come, like right now in typhoon season, there's no sedimentation flooding down off a log dairy or a place where a Canadian company came and strip mined. And as a result, because the Filipino people don't just eat rice, they eat fish. The sediment won't then wash down the riverway and it won't kill the coral. They have 85% of the world's varieties of corals in the Philippines and their fishery is preserved because you paid for the rice. Do you know how hard it is to get this story out on a box? <laughs> That's the depth of story behind every product we sell at Level Ground. Rice, spice, coconut oil, and so on. So this year is our 17th year in business. We'll be buying the harvests of 5,000 fa farming families in 10 countries. And a lineup of our product is primarily coffees that we import from six countries. A line of dried tropical fruit, cacao nibs, organic cane sugar, loose teas from India, coconut oil, and vanilla beans from Uganda, and we're adding spices and rices this year. Our whole goal is focus on farmers, but sell the product based on not, we're ethical, so you should buy our product. We try to sell focusing on qualities, that it's the best chai tea, the best organic dried mango, the best shot of espresso you've ever had. And over time, you'll be loving our product, loyal to it, and as a result, you'll learn about the ethics of who we are and what we do. We also post what we pay for all our products on our website, so that if people want to question how much did the farmer really get, we'll tell them our whole trading history with the community, which is something most businesses aren't usually willing to share. Our vision is really cool. It's to alleviate poverty. And as soon as I heard people talking yesterday about the dignity needed and the respect needed for people who are picking through waste in places like Brazil, I was like, this is why I know I'm in the right room. Because there's a human component to everything that's being done. And we know that when the environment is championed, it's done when people have been championed and they go hand in glove with each other. And when people ask me why I started out Level Ground with my wife and a few other families back in 97, I talk about this. If wealth was the inevitable result of hard work and enterprise, every woman in Africa would be a millionaire. Yeah. yeah. In short, the world's not fair. And I just happen to believe in a God who deeply loves people who are poor and treated unfairly. So I felt that I had to find not a way to do a hobby response to poverty, not just adopting kids who are from an orphanage, which I've done, but find a way to respond with my whole body, my whole being in a visceral sort of way that says, I am compelled to do something to respond to the poverty that is so rampant. It can be done in a thoughtful and ethical way. Trade's also very impersonal. Whether it's groceries or electronics or furniture, that's how it travels. And how do we put a face in a globalized economy of people behind products that we actually connect the dots? And as soon as you've met a person from another country where you've traveled, and you see that country's name on the tag of a product or a sticker, you have a human connection to that place because you know someone. 
and the world gets a little smaller and it gets personal. And as soon as we stop spending money based on price only, we think bigger and long-term externalizing of costs versus internalizing of costs like was covered yesterday as well. That's entirely what we're trying to do as a business. So I'll just give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. Our dried tropical fruit line started because in Colombia, where it's from, at any time, a tenth of the population is displaced by rural violence. And mango is something that grows there, like blackberries grow here along the fence lines, and it just falls off the tree and rots. We thought we could create a market for the mango that would be year-round and create jobs for the people who needed them with that fruit that was going to waste. Our product now represents full-time employment for 200 people in Colombia, South America. Colombians own 80% of the company, and the coolest thing about drying fruit is you get rid of the pits and the peel and the water, and so if you take the fresh fruit weight of what we buy every year and convert it to what we bring into Canada, about 9% of the weight of what was harvested makes it out of Colombia. 91% of the weight stays behind. So as a result, you take a fruit that was going to rot within a week, it's picked the same day that we cut it and dry it, and now it's shelf-stable for two years and it creates jobs. And that's been a powerful way. Now these women are selling fruit that's dried into Italy, into the States, as well as Canada. We only speak for part of it. And the Red Cross has adopted it all through the country as a way to permanently have food supplies available with dried fruit and vegetables for people who are displaced by rural violence like these women were. So our premise is that for sustainable behavior, you don't start by hugging the tree. You recognize the trees on someone's land and their life is often miserable and very frustrating and unpredictable. And if we place consistent orders and provide predictable prices in the context of a long-term relationship, the person is cared for and respected and the result is the tree on his or her land stays. People in desperate times do desperate things. They don't want to take the tree down, but they will if they have to use it for fuel to cook food for their families. Visit Haiti if you haven't and see a, a nation that's been logged because of desperate times. So you start hugging the people and you've looked after everything that's on their land as well. Now I'll just talk a little bit about our waste management. We've had for 10 years 13 streams of recycling that we gather, but the blue box only covers five in our municipality. So the eight additional streams we pay to have picked up and recycled and we extend that to all 30 of our staffs so that their homes can be landfill free just like their workplace is landfill free. We have about a million pounds of product, maybe a million and a half pounds that'll go through our facility this year and nothing goes to landfill. We have one dumpster and it's for recycled cardboard. Our, our coffee all comes in biodegradable or compostable sacks. So local farmers use it as ground cover and on the west coast where it's wet here, in one year's time those sacks turn to soil. But they also keep down weeds at key times and let earthworms come to the surface. Chaff is our biggest byproduct, and it's just compost gold. It suppresses the odor of food scraps and absorbs the moisture of food scraps and makes for way better compost than if it didn't have coffee chaff added. We log all of our staff commutes to and from work. We pay them to cycle, take mass transit, or carpool, and they're paid for finding a way other than just single occupant vehicle to work. But here's our packaging curse. To keep coffee fresh and dried mango fresh and all the other products we sell, to keep them in really good shape, we end up using multiply packaging, which everybody around the world, no matter what conference we go to on packaging, says this is what you have to use and this is all we produce and this is your only choice. You put something in glass and your shipper says, I have to be able to drop it on a concrete floor from one meter and if it breaks, it's your fault. So the weight and the breakability of it makes it inviolable. If you have a container that's expanded out before it's filled, like a tin can, you have a whole warehouse full of empties that takes as much space as full and your warehousing costs are through the roof even if you wanted to use metal or tin in any form. So we've been struggling with our packaging curse for so long. It has great freshness factor and great print quality but it's multiply and it's unrecyclable. So we've been reclaiming our empty packages. It's not mandated, it's not required. The government doesn't ask it of us, but for about eight years at over 100 locations in Western Canada, we've had the customer service desk only for our product to take it back from the customers when they're done with it. So when you're done with your package of mango, thanks, or you're done with your package of coffee, bring it back to the grocery store with you where you bought it, and when our sales rep comes in, not only will he or she take the order, they'll take away your empties. So it's like voluntary return and we set up the system. As a result, we've created a job for a woman who left uh, Iran when she was a professional sewer with her four kids. She's a refugee to Victoria, 
and we bought her a commercial sewing machine and we rent space for her. And she makes funky little bags like this and we call this upcycling. It says here in the pet tag it was upcycled by Nahid. So it's jobs for her. And every quarter I give her a contract to sew more stuff and we cover all her expenses and machine repairs so there's no extra cost to her. She just gets paid a certain amount, uh, $6.50 for the labor to sew every one of those bags and then we give her all the supplies. So that's a bit of a response, but the further away we sell our products, the harder it is to get them back. Some accounts won't set up a re reclamation station, so we can't get them back. A lot of customers who buy the product would love, but don't know how to find out or to be educated that this is something we'll take back and upcycle. So this is the finished product, but here's our challenge, and this is where my questions are, and I'll close up, okay? I don't know if you've heard of MMBC, but I start to want to swear and curse as soon as I heard those, hear those four letters now. They confuse me, they confound me, they take my money and don't give me answers to my questions. So they've come about in the last two years. They're operated by the Canadian Steward Service Alliance and if you're in this room representing them, please talk to me later so I can understand you better. Um, they operate all aspects, I understand, of multi-materials in Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, BC. And if I'm wrong on this, it's because I misunderstood on a phone call even this week trying to understand it again. Previously, residential customers in BC paid through their taxes the total cost of curbside recycling and everything related to recycling initiatives in the province. And as of two years ago, with the advent of MMBC, that's completely been collapsed. My taxes didn't go down, but apparently as a residential customer, I'm not paying for blue boxes anymore. Now 100% of the cost for blue boxes has been shifted to BC companies that sell into the BC marketplace. If I sell my product to Alberta, I don't have to pay. Just the stuff that goes through my system to BC. So I have to have a staff person, pretty much half time, just documenting everything that goes through my facility that gets sold into BC, so that I can voluntarily tell them, and I don't know if there's others voluntarily not telling, like not disclosing fully, but my current cost is $1,800 a quarter, over $7,000 a year, but they don't take back any of my product. And they're not bailing it and waiting and looking for a solution. And I'm confused. I'm spending a lot of money. My packaging works from a freshness standpoint. doesn't work at all from a zero waste mandate point. It's impossible to educate on. And when I talk to Oncorp or any other reclamation, they say you don't have enough tonnage for us to make a system. Well, virtually every coffee roaster selling good quality coffee is using the same type of materials. Can't you get enough tonnage with us collectively and some redesign ideas that it innovate? So I'm out of time, Stacy at levelground.com. I'd love emails, suggestions, ideas. What can we do different and better? Is MMBC my enemy? Are they my ally? Should I be working with them? My business partner is saying stop paying. Stop paying till you piss them off enough. But here's our challenge. Grocery chains to whom we sell have been said that if every one of your suppliers isn't an MMBC voluntary steward, you have to stop taking their product. Okay, so we get like London Drugs, Country Grocer, different sizes of businesses. They told us if you don't do it, we stop carrying your product because we're mandated that all of our suppliers have to be MMBC voluntary stewards. So I don't have an easy way out. So I'll be around for a few more hours today before I go back home. I'd love to hear your thoughts or chat with you further. Thanks.